Hello, BookTube. I was recently watching a video from a small BookTuber, Will's Infinite Library. Uh, he did a roundup kind of video where he talks about a whole bunch of different books. Uh, and one of them was Jitterbug Perfume by Tom Robbins. And I was, I was curious about that. It, you hardly ever hear anybody talk about Tom Robbins. Most of his books, I think, are probably out of print. They're certainly not modeled in bookstores anymore the way they were 20 years ago when all of his books were modeled in bookstores, and uh, that, which meant that if you sold one, you got one back. Uh, he seems to be fading a little, or maybe a lot, as an author. And I thought that was remarkable. And then Will followed that up with an even better video. I'll leave a link to it down below, where he talks about Jitterbug Perfume in context of it being his favorite book of all time. Describes the book, and then describes what he loves about it. Uh, I thought that was absolutely fantastic. I have, I have a great deal of, uh, of simpatico for Will because he's a, a gentle, soft-spoken young guy, and so am I. Uh, he has 20 subscribers to his channel, and I think we can agree that he needs more. <laughs> he needs more subscribers. 100 would be good. Uh, with 20 subscribers, you can't be sure that it's not just your friends that are subscribed to your channel. Your fr his friends and me, <laughs> so me and 19 friends. Whereas if you have 100 subscribers, well, then those aren't, nobody has a hundred friends, except for Leslie at the Nerdy Narrative. Nobody has a hundred friends. So then you know you're actually reaching an audience. Uh, I'll leave a link to his channel down below. If you like what you see, feel free to subscribe. Uh, but it got me thinking. <laughs> that second video on Tom Robbins got me thinking. And naturally, it made me want to pounce. So I did. And I am weaponizing his video into a tag, the My Favorite Book of All Time tag, which is very simple. It does not have a list of prompts. It is very simple. And it's also kind of nosy in the way that I like my tags to be. What I want you to do for the My Favorite Book of All Time tag is tell me about your favorite book of all time. No equivocating, no top three, no nothing like that. You know you have a favorite book. I want to hear about it. So your task for your favorite book of all time tag should be to tell everybody about your favorite book of all time. Now, in this little corner of BookTube, that is a risk-free proposition because we don't judge. We're all friends here. We might poke fun, <laughs> but that's not the same thing as judging. Here, you are free to say what your favorite book of all time is and tell people about it. I think that is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And another thing, another stricture on the My Favorite Book of All Time tag that I'm imposing on myself, as well as you, is 15 minutes or less. Don't go on for an hour. Uh, tell me what, you, what your favorite book of all time is and tell me a little bit about it and why you love it in 15 minutes or less. That's the tag, and you're all tagged. <laughs> you must do two things. Your two calls to action for this video. One, go to Will's channel and subscribe. I mean, who wouldn't be discouraged if, if they only have 20 subscribers after, what, eight videos? Uh, and two, stick to 15 minutes. Pick one single book and stick to 15 minutes. Now, for me, uh, the object of this tag is well-known, will be well-known to any of you who watch this channel on a regular basis, because for me... Uh, my favorite book of all time is Ovid's Metamorphoses. Uh, this is the Roman poet Ovid. And this is a long work of his. It's as long as the Odyssey. Uh, it's a long work of his about change. Uh, this, he, he had this finished and ready to, to show to the world in the year 8. 88. Anno Domini 8. Uh, right around the same time that he was also working on something else. He was working on two major works at, in the year 8. One was the Fasti, uh, another long poem. This one, a uh, little bit more didactic, a little bit more straight-laced, although it would still have genius in it, as everything that Ovid did had genius in it, about the Roman calendar, about Roman uh, holy days and uh, their observances and their long traditions and whatnot. Very traditional work. But he was also working on this, and there is nothing traditional about this work. There's nothing like it anywhere in the ancient canon, nor anywhere since. It's astonishing, an astonishing work about change, about things changing from one to another. As Ovid says over and over again, everything changes. So he starts off the book, in, it's sort of three rough stages of the book, if you want to call it that. Uh, he starts it off with the world precipitating out of chaos into its current state, and then retracing, retelling in virtuoso verse uh, the great and famous Greek myths and a whole bunch of obscure Greek myths, any Greek myth really that he had his hands on that involves something changing into something else. People changing into trees, the famous Bernini sculpture there, uh, or 
people changing into waterfalls or rivers or stars or spiders or whatnot, men changing into women, women changing into men, all that sort of stuff. Anything in the ancient Greek canon that he could find is told here. Maybe one character will start to tell a story and then the, one of the characters in their story will start to tell a story and so on and so forth. And then the second rough phase of the book shifts to Roman mythology, uh, including uh, Aeneas, including the, the subject matter of, of the, the previous great poet of, of Rome, Virgil. Uh, Virgil had been dead for a while when Ovid wrote this book, though Ovid had no peer as a Roman poet. He was the foremost poet of his day. Uh, and clearly, I think, in the Fasti and the Metamorphoses, wanted to up his game in terms of art in order to corroborate that, in order to go along with that. He had, he had built his entire career writing in a different, in a different meter, in a, a kind of ditty of a, of a meter, a lighter meter meant for lighter fare. He'd written about love affairs gone wrong, love affairs gone right, makeup, uh, snarky irony about uh, romantic morality and marriage and whatnot. And he'd been delighted. He'd met, he met with a huge amount of success. People loved that. He was so good at it that people loved it. And I think the, the Fasti and the Metamorphoses germinating together show an artist who wanted to do something different, who wanted to do something more. I think that's shown beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, in the fact that he doesn't use that rhythm for the Metamorphoses. He shifts to dactylic hexameter, to Homer's own rhythm, and the rhythm of Virgil. He shifts to the kind of grand epic rhythm that he had spent a lot of time in his previous poems mocking. And if not mocking, at the very least saying he himself was not cut out for that kind of thing. And uh, it turns out he was practicing it the whole time. This, uh, the, the sheer virtuosity of the metamorphoses reminds me of a comment that a friend of mine made about a mutual acquaintance who went out on the dance floor for the first time in front of both of us. Neither one of us has ever heard, heard him talk about dancing before. And he was really good. But I, I looked at my friend and she said, he strikes me as the kind of person who would never do something until he knew he could do it well. And that is the Metamorphoses too, in a nutshell, because this is absolutely brilliant. The third part of it is about the changes, the, the metamorphoses that have happened in Ovid's own in Ovid's own time. Not in Roman mythology, but in Roman history. The change from a republic to uh, basically a one-man rule, a first a first citizen of Augustus. Uh, and all throughout there is amazing wordplay, amazing just shimmering brilliance in the writing of this. And the unfortunate part about that is that like so much Latin literature, it's an iceberg. 10% of it is on the surface of an English language translation, which is what you'll get. In an English language translation, you will get 10% uh, of the work is conveyable. And the other 90%, you're really gonna have to, let me get you another cover here so you're not just looking at the same one. Uh, the other 90% is, uh, oh, no, polite. There we go. The other 90% is going to be buried. It's going to be beyond the ability of the translator to really convey. And the main pro the main reason for that is the, the fundamental difference between Latin and English. In English, word order means a huge amount. And in Latin, it doesn't. Uh, in English, uh, the man kicks the horse is a different sentence from the horse kicks the man. And there's nothing you can do to the word man to change that fact. If the sentence is man kicks horse, it means one thing. If the sentence is horse kicks man, it means something different. The words are exactly the same. They look the same. They're spelled the same. You just plug them in in different places in the sentence. And if you want the sentence to say something different, you have to add more words. You can't just use the ones you have in a different order. You have to add more words. The man was kicked by the horse. The horse was kicked by the man. Uh, that's not true in Latin. In Latin, the word itself tells you what it's doing in the sentence, which means it doesn't have to be anywhere particular in the sentence to tell you that. And that opens up the door for a huge amount of artistry in the right hands. And there were, at the time when Ovid was writing this poem, there were no better hands. He was writing, uh, he was writing Latin better than anyone in the world. Uh, and went all out. He, he goes all out uh, in this poem to show rhetorical brilliance, to do things with that particular uh, construction that, uh, 
that can't be duplicated in English, unfortunately. Uh, let me see. Let me get you another cover here so that I'm not just nattering away. Uh, Again, there's the Norton Critical Edition. Uh, I'm eating into my time here <laughs> because you're stuck to your time. You're, there we go. Uh, in in Ovid, the the uh, the word order doesn't matter so much. It, it, it's the word will tell you where it belongs in the sentence, and therefore it can sometimes even be left out. It can be gapped right out of the sentence. Uh, that allows for a genius that is not going to be reproducible. In English. So the English translations that you get will sometimes be very good. The, the current Penguin classic is a verse translation. It's very, very good. The Horace Gregory translation from a half a century ago is very, very good. The Rayburn translation from Oxford, I think, is are very, very good. Uh, and the main reason that I'm not saying that that's a total wash is because even that level of this poem is great. The, the sheer pyrotechnics of the storytelling is great. Ovid shifts his register of storytelling from comic to tragedy to serious to historical and back again sometimes in the course of even one passage. Uh, so even if you don't know Latin, I'm assuming that most of you don't, you're still going to love this book in a way that I would argue you probably won't love much work from ancient Rome. You certainly will love this in a different way than you love the Aeneid, which was on Ovid's mind the whole time. He was thinking about the Aeneid the whole time that he was composing this. Uh, and the, like I mentioned, the third part of the book is him dwelling on more contemporary transformations, more contemporary changes in his world from republic to empire, the change of forms of government and whatnot, uh, which started to get a little bit closer to the live wire of actual politics because he was the foremost poet of his day. He wasn't an anonymous scabrous scribbler anymore. Augustus was paying attention to what he wrote. Uh, and had been paying attention to his earlier books, which made light of conventional morality and urged people to take lovers and have affairs and uh, risk abortions and tart themselves up and whatnot. <laughs> and uh, it sat poorly with Augustus. All of that stuff sat poorly with him. And that, and one other thing, occasioned a very unwelcome metamorphosis in Ovid's own life. The year that the Fasti and the Metamorphoses were finished and foisted on the world, he was exiled from Rome, for something that he wrote and something that he saw. Now, what he wrote is pretty obvious. It's his books on love. They're pretty scandalous. They're pretty against the, the moral program that Augustus was trying to promulgate. What he saw, we'll never know. Uh, but it had to be pretty bad, or at least pretty embarrassing, because Augustus never recalled him. And Ovid wrote many, many letters and famous poems. He, was, he kept writing when he was on the other side of the world. Uh, he kept writing in exile piteous, long, gorgeous letters from exile begging to be allowed to return home. He was given a pretty bald choice. Go into exile without your family, without your children, without your wife, without any kind of support or anything like that. The only reason a man would take a choice like that is if he were told, if you don't do that, we'll go after them. If you do go, after, if you do go alone, we'll leave them alone. They'll have their property and everything else. But if you don't, they'll suffer the same, right along with you. That's the only reason that that anyone would do that, and Ovid did. He went into exile, and whatever he saw that was so bad uh, was so bad that even when Augustus died, his successor, Tiberius, did not recall Ovid. It was one of the first things that people asked him. Will you please recall the poet? That's what the Romans called him, the poet. And he didn't. He refused. Ovid, di Ovid died in exile, miserable in exile. Uh, but there was one other transformation, one other metamorphosis that he had correctly foreseen at the end of his poem, at the end of this incredible, incredible poem that I urge you all to try, even in English. Uh, he says that one last transformation was that his poem will transform him into an immortal. And he was right. Poor comfort for a man dying in the cold in exile far from anyone he loves, but he was right. We're still reading this thing. We still love it. It's influenced all of, of Western literature. So he was right. That final transformation he, con he, he conducted upon himself. Uh, and it's the uh, my parting recommendation to you for the for this great poem that this is my favorite book of all time, uh, mainly because it's endless, the inventiveness, the linguistic and rhetorical inventiveness, but also the stories themselves are endless. It is an endless work of fun, and pathos and sentiment and artistic achievement. It's endless. You can go back to it over and over again. It's very rare to get that book, that kind of a book, written by only one person. 
and the Metamorphoses is one of them. So that is my favorite book of all time, and now I want to hear yours. You are now all tagged in the favorite book of all time tag. So go to Will's channel and subscribe, and then tell me all about your favorite book. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.